Before I do, I want to tell you the basic format of today's discussion will be a discussion lasting about an hour, I suppose, and then we'll take some questions from the floor. Uh, I request that the questions be written, and there'll be people that will collect these questions and bring them up to the panel here. Uh, starting on my left, your right, we have Jerry Aid, works with Norby Walters, who is uh, clearly the most eminent, I think, in the black music business, and uh, they're in other fields as well, but they've made their name and mark in that particular endeavor. Sitting next to him is Doug Borg. Doug Borg is one of the principals of the Don Law Company, one of the largest promoters in New England. Next to him, we have Fred Ordauer. Fred Ordauer works with Allied Ogden. Fred used to be with Jam Productions, which is, I guess, the largest promoter in Chicago area. And he's left <coughs> promotion to get involved in promotion. So he'll be uh, <laughs> commenting on that, I'm sure. Next to him is the controversial figure of Mike McGinley, known to his friends and enemies as the Goon. And he likes the name, so you can feel free to address him in that manner. His association with lookout management, as well as things he's done on his own, uh, has enabled him to be involved in the planning and execution and every phase of touring with acts like uh, The Cars, Yes, Bob Dylan, Tom Petty. Then we have Ian Copeland. Ian Copeland hardly needs an introduction. He's one of the pioneers of New Music Seminar, which this used to actually be about new music. Now it's just about music. But Ian, uh, as I say, I believe is known to all of you and was from the first, the first, <laughs> he's a veteran of every single seminar and a perennial on the panel. To my right is John Scher, he's president of Monarch Entertainment and uh, John Scher presents. I wonder who that's named after, but uh, John is involved in many endeavors uh, from promotion uh, in this area, upstate New York, but also in management. Uh, after a fashion, he's involved with uh, the Grateful Dead and Lou Reed, Art of Noise, and Dave Edmonds. Doug Thaler is next to John. Uh, he's the co-manager of clearly the two of the hottest bands of 87, and hopefully beyond 87 as well, but Bon Jovi and, uh, and Motley Crue, and also the Unforgiven. He's also the winner of the Coolest Suit uh, on the Panel Award. <coughs> <laughs> and uh, he'll be offering the management point of view. Doug also is an agent, as a, by the way, so he started out. I happen to know. All of us start out as agents. Some of us stay there. Yeah, well, okay. Jane Garrity is next to Doug, and uh, she's involved with booking Bon Jovi, as well as some of the other stellar attractions of the music business, Bruce Springsteen and, and U2, which I'd like to have some kind of discussion as to who's bigger, U2 or Bon Jovi, but we'll let's leave that for later. But she's with Premier Talent Agency, one the, another kind of pioneer as well. Rob Light is right next to John, uh, excuse me, to, uh, to Jane, and Rob is with CAA, which is uh, a huge agency, very successful on the West Coast. Uh, Rob oversees the tours of Madonna, Prince, and some other acts you may have heard of. At any rate, I'd like to start off uh, today uh, with, we have two topics in mind. One is we want to talk about a trend where buildings are promoting shows, uh, not just in their buildings, but they're promoting shows often outside of buildings. And this is important to us uh, here on the panel, but it's also important, I think, to people who are starting out insofar as uh, buildings, if they are actually going to be promoters, are going to be competing with people who are trying to get out uh, and become promoters. Uh, they want to buy things in all kinds of venues outside of their venues, and outside the venues that they run and operate. And it's something that uh, it could be the beginning of a trend. There's an upside to it and there's a downside to it. And I'd like to get involved in discussing the pros and cons of, of this entire situation. We'd also like to talk about the trend uh, that seems to be developing. Mr. McGinley will address this, I'm sure, quite a bit in the panel today, of bigger acts being booked without agencies. Uh, Mr. McGinley, or I'm sorry, the goon, <laughs> keep forgetting. Uh, has most recently booked a Mick Jagger tour, which is uh, forthcoming. Hasn't played yet. But he's not an agent. Uh, he's not an agency. It's an entirely different arrangement. And uh, this actually there's some comparisons, I think, with this situation and people starting out as well, insofar as very often new acts can't get agents either. <laughs> so we'll, <laughs> we'll address that. But I'd like to begin by asking some of the promoters on the panel uh, if they feel that some buildings that they, uh, in their markets, their respective markets that they promote in, 
have made overtures to promote in competition with them. And I'd like to start with John, because he's the closest to me, and ask him if he's had any experiences with buildings that uh, may be competing with him to book acts and what his opinion is on it. Well, the markets that, uh, that our company promotes, is, there's a number of uh, facilities, um, most, most prominently in New York City, uh, Radio City Music Hall which is uh, probably the, the, the most important theater-sized venue in America, uh, has for many years now self-promoted, won't rent their facility to uh, myself or any other outside promoters, and has, uh, basically has a monopoly uh, on their own facility, which as I said is probably the consensus would be is the most important, certainly the most important mid-sized facility in New York, perhaps in the country. Uh, then there, of course, are um, a number of facilities that are summertime facilities. The Garden State Arts Center in New Jersey, which is run by the New Jersey Highway Authority, uh, has an exclusive on their own facility and doesn't allow promoters uh, into that facility. And then there's a facility in uh, um, Canandaigua, New York, called the Finger Lakes Performing Arts Center, which is uh, a facility that, that promotes its own shows. Um, my experience with those facilities are that uh, in each particular case, they're unique facilities, and they're facilities that artists choose to play because of their uniqueness, despite the fact that they might rather have a promoter, whether it be our company or someone else, be involved in that promotion. Uh, they feel that those are the right facilities for their artists to play uh, at a particular point in their career, and hence, even though the promoter may have played that artist from a, on a, from a club attraction, uh, up through um, headlining the theaters. Uh, once they want to, they, they reach that size venue, if the promoter can't get into the facility, he loses the opportunity to participate uh, in that key promotion or that key show. So I, I think it's, um, it's to some degree detrimental to the artists unless they are artists that are instant sellouts because generally those facilities do not have the expertise to really go out and create the excitement and promote the show in a way that an independent entrepreneurial promoter might. Uh, and of course it's detrimental to the promoter who's, who has put the time and effort and money behind that artist from an early stage uh, and has it taken away from them because they don't have a, a they can't get into an, an artist. Uh, I mean, the artist that they promote, uh, they, can't, they don't have the availability of that particular facility. So you're saying in certain instances you can't compete, then, if it's an exclusive like with Radio City Music Hall? Exactly. Interest, interestingly, the, when Radio City decided to, uh, to change its policy from movies and the Rockettes to, to putting on concerts, um, our company promoted the first uh, series of concerts there about five years ago with the Grateful Dead, mm -hmm. which they've pointed to in all of their press, pre, press releases and stories as the key turning point of making it into a viable rock facility. But after we did that, they wouldn't let us or anyone else promote them. Hmm. Have you had any experiences in buildings that are available to anybody, such as the Meadowlands, where uh, the buildings expressed an interest in, in promoting a show uh, in lieu of you? Well, the, the, the Meadowlands has, uh, on one occasion, uh, participated in, in, uh, in promoting a concert. But that was after the artist made it clear that there wasn't going to be a promoter involved. The artist mm -hmm. really self-promoted. Mm -hmm. But at least in the facilities that we work with on a regular basis in New York uh, and New Jersey and in upstate New York, none of the facilities are actively interested in, in, uh, in promoting and self-promoting. Uh, they are actively interested in getting as many shows as they possibly can. So when given the choice of you get the show only if you'll self-promote it, because we don't want a promoter involved, I think uh, that's a different set of circumstances and something that you would expect a building that's being entrepreneurial to do, rather than in some cases facilities such in Pittsburgh that is actively out there trying to buy, um, or uh, for, for the company Fred represents, uh, Allied, which has now put together, a, as I understand it, a, an entire unit to go out and try to promote. Doug, uh, do you have anything to add to that, Doug Borg? Well, I think it might be, um, from our point of view, <coughs> to view how the building should be what their role is in this business, and especially in terms of self-promotion. I think that it's fair to say that buildings can be divided really into two classes from their point of view. 
Uh, for some facilities, it's a function of what their market share is and how many events they get in an active market. And for some who are in secondary or tertiary markets, it's really a function of survival. And it can be viewed very differently. Um, it's also important to see what the role of, a, of an active promoter should be. In our particular case, um, we've been in business almost 20 years and have many of the people on this panel. And we view it as our function as a full service promotional company, which means that we take the same kind of effort, possibly even more, at the small level and the clubs of 500 seats or below as we do at stadium level of 60,000 seats. Um, most people here on this panel have prospered over the years precisely because they've invested in the future. And they've decided they're going to be long-term players. That most of us here can remember when Bon Jovi was a club act. I can remember when U2 played at the club level to 250 people. Um, <coughs> today's headliners that look like they're instant stars often take a great deal of work and take the foresight and the commitment at the early level to invest in acts that really no one knows and to do it and put the same kind of effort at 250 or 500 seats or 2,000 seats as you would at 15,000 and above. Um, the real issue here is in an active market, um, from the building's point of view, I think, is are they getting their fair share of dates? Is the person who's locally taking that kind of risk in the marketplace uh, doing maximizing the potential for everybody, acts and buildings as well? Um, and, and it can be in a different case where you're talking about a, a third level market where they have no activity at all and no one's paying attention, then possibly the issue of a building being involved on its own has some merit. But traditionally, the only people in the live concert business who are willing to put the money on the table, take the risk that's involved, uh, and take the shots with acts that are not guaranteed by any stretch of the imagination, are, as John put it, entrepreneurial promoters who have the kind of moxie and also have the knowledge of their marketplace, who can be the, f the bank, who can be the underwriter, who can be the production liaison, who can be the media traffic point, um, who can have the knowledge of the political landscape and the business community. You really, the, the focal point of the live business is a good, active, aggressive entrepreneur who's not afraid to take risk and not afraid to lose money and by the same token expect some kind of reward for that down the line. Fred, um, John has made the observation that you might be involved in doing some promotions with Allied Ogden. Uh, is this what's going to happen or is happening right now? Can, can you comment on that? Because you represent, you're involved in buildings management as well as food concessions and other associated uh, uh, fields, but are you going to be doing promotion for buildings? Ogden Allied has already uh, produced a number of shows uh, in facilities that we provide some level of service at. Uh, it's been doing it for four months now, and it's going to be a, a continuing, ongoing uh, process. Uh, we're going to do it in facilities that uh, we provide services in or would like to provide services in, and we're also going to use the uh, understanding and, and uh, capacity that we have to uh, help make sure that uh, shows and conventions and, and all kinds of events uh, play facilities that we represent. Why are you doing this? There are many, many facilities that we provide uh, some level of service at that for a collection of reasons when, a, when an artist goes out and does a 50 or 60 day tour uh, and there's 200 buildings to play in America, uh, that means 140 buildings don't get the show. And we, we uh, are in the business of providing services. If a building is dark, uh, it's just a, it's the service that you're providing. You're looking at that. One. It's a, it's a, it's a continuing, ongoing process of expanding our service line to include a component that uh, many of the facilities that we represent uh, have cried out for, mm -hmm. helping them solve the biggest problem they've got, which is dark days. So, so are you going to confine your activities to buildings that you represent, or are you going or, to or that we would like to represent? And it's, like so it's it's pretty much open then. Isn't it? I mean, you could excuse me. That that's complete bullshit, and you know that as well as I do. You you try to promote the Boston shows at Meadowlands, which you have no ongoing relationship with at all. You have no ability. There's a long-term contract with Harry M. Stevens that does the concessions. All the other services that you provide are done. Uh, in-house by the Meadowlands. There's no hope or real, realistic view that Allied Ogden can do any kind of uh, 
other services with them, yet you made an offer to, uh, for Boston to play there. As Jeff was the agent, he can verify that. Wow. You, did, you weren't successful, and we had a, a very mm -hmm. successful four-day run with them, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, you tried to promote the shows. Mm -hmm. The cleaning contract, the uh, housekeeping and janitorial and maintenance contract was up for bid at the time that offer was made, and just as the analogy was uh, that you gave that the only show that you have that has played the Meadowlands that you uh, that wasn't done by a promoter but was done in house. Uh, you're familiar that much of those same circumstances were present. Uh, uh, ICM asked us to make an offer. We didn't. Uh, we didn't go out and pursue the date uh, on our own. So I'm not saying that you pursued it. I'm just saying you made a statement a minute ago that you were only interested in doing providing the service and facilities that you have an ongoing or potential future relationship. I'm sorry, I disagree with you. There's no, there's no cleaning, you, there's no like cleaning see, contract that, that's would up you like to see the? Would yeah. you like to see the bid specs? I'd love to, yeah. And Fred, have you been successful so far in your endeavors in promotion? Allied Hockey? Very successful. Very if you continue with the success, do you think it's, it seems entirely possible to me that like FMI and other companies that provide similar services to buildings would also engage in promotion as well? So are you promoting, do you perceive your role as promoting in competition with promoters who do nothing but promote. The reason that Ogden Allied uh, chose me to uh, develop this capability uh, comes from their very good job of doing the homework of the way the world is and to understand that in the 1980s and the 1990s the world consists of something called regional promoters. which called is what? regional promoters, mm -hmm. which is the culture that I came from, uh, being one for 15 years. Uh, it's a culture that I uh, flourished in, that I enjoyed, that I have a lot of respect for, um, and that contrary to uh, what people think we're doing, uh, we are embracing the local promoter. We are embracing the local promoter who is doing a good job in a building, um, and where the car is working properly, we're not going to go into the hood. We provide most of the services at the Forum in Los Angeles, from parking cars to tearing tickets to selling food and beverage and hot dogs and sweeping the building when the show's over. Yet that building is a very, very busy building. And there's a very good promoter in Los Angeles who does an excellent job of, of keeping that building busy. Uh, when and if a circumstance should arise where that promoter needs help or an agent or a manager needs help fitting the show in the building, we'll give it. And where it's not needed, we won't. We'll stay out of it. Uh, if, it's, if it's not uh, broken, we're not going to try and fix it. But there's certainly, there are certainly enough changes that are going on in the, the entertainment industry uh, and making facilities, particularly in secondary markets, attractive to shows where uh, we're going to continue to gravitate towards uh, helping evolve and helping bring this uh, build, bring buildings up to speed with, with the needs that a show has that's, that's doing a limited tour. Doug, did you have a comment to make? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> um, I don't know Fred. I've heard of him, and I know him to be a capable man, and his company is, I'm sure, capable as well. <clears throat> but there's an inherent flaw, I think, in the approach that a building should be uh, promoting on its own uh, that I think would affect a lot of people in this particular audience. <clears throat> and I speak from some direct experience. There are colleagues of mine in the audience here who have been working very hard in bringing a new act uh, to fruition. It's going to be a difficult work project. If companies like Ogden Allied are going to be in the promotion business, as I see it right now, I do not see any function that a company like that can perform to make an act, which no one knows about now, become a future headliner. There are a half dozen or more people here on this dais Every agent here, people like John Scher, people like Dave Williams who could not make it here, who are the people who are going to make an act like this become potentially next year's headliner. They're the people who will make the effort. They're the people who will invest their time and money and their expertise. They will make dates happen. They will present opportunities. They will book people properly, package people properly. They'll put the effort into a complete unknown act, and they will give it its best shot to make it develop into a potential headliner. And the future of the business, the core of the business, is in fact at the very level where many of you people here in the audience represent. And that's where the effort's got to be made. That's where uh, next year's police is going to be. I 
can remember again, it's my only last comment about the, the past. Do I remember when the police were playing at 250 seats at the Paradise? Oh, that Poughkeepsie. Yeah. No. <laughs> Paradise. Is and it went all the way to 60,000 seats right. at the stadium. But to get to that level took two club dates and half a dozen theater dates before that finally happened. And you've got to have, at each level, I think the role of the agent, an active agency, which is involved in buying and selling at all levels, constantly knows the marketplace, knows the people to deal with, knows the places to book them. Uh, that really, in a strong sense, I think, from a management point of view, is essential to the success of the future act. Uh, Doug Thaler, I'd like to ask you, as a manager of acts that are playing large buildings, such as the buildings that are represented by Ogden Allied, and, and I don't mean to seem like Ogden Allied is representing the entire point of view of buildings, so I, I hope we're not being unjust to Fred over here. But does it matter to you if, you're gonna, if you know you're going to play a market like Los Angeles, you're going to play the form, you've made that decision, how much does it matter who you play for at this particular level with a band like uh, Motley Crue or Bon Jovi? Well, certainly the, you know, one of the considerations is, is the responsibility to try to make the, the act the most money in the marketplace, the most money in the building. Um, and then on the other side of it, there's like, you know, the, a sense of loyalty. Um, Motley Crue live in, in Los Angeles, and uh, they get uh, free tickets to all the shows for them, their families, their half crazy stepchildren, and the, the whole <laughs> nine yards. And uh, um, I want, certainly, I want that there's lots of them. Too. <laughs> S certainly, I don't think that, you know, like, for a few pennies more or a few dollars more, we'd change for a significant uh, amount of money more. I have to, like, <laughs> take, take, give serious consideration to whoever can pick up the phone that day. So. Sure. Um, I, I think, not, not to overly attack Fred, but I, I think that this is a bigger issue. And with, with, with the new music seminar in particular, the new music aspect's the most important thing. Fred, Fred's operation isn't um, a danger to the public and isn't really a danger to the major headliners. What it's a danger to are the promoters and the agents. Those are the people that, it, that it's a danger to because... And it's, the it's, it's, Well, it's the relationship between the agents and the promoters that, 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 that both are in the, in the relationship of trying to break new acts. The relationship of, the, of, of an agent going out, signing a new act, a new exciting act. I mean, Ian built a, a huge company that started out with no established acts. And, and uh, if the local promoters weren't there, then he wouldn't have been in business. Now, what, 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 Ogden, what Ogden does, or, or, or Pittsburgh, or any of the buildings that self-promote and don't involve a promoter, um, they're not interested. I don't think Fred's going to be running out to try to do something at the, uh, uh, you know, at the, the Penny Arcade in Rochester to, uh, for, the, for the honor of losing $1,000 on a sold-out show. Um, and I don't blame them. Cause they're in a huge, it's a Fortune 500 company, it's a huge company, and they have a different set of priorities than the promoters and the, and the agents who are trying to perpetuate an industry where the new artists can come. So I think that although I sound like I'm attacking Fred, and, and I, I am to some degree, I think, I think some of the things he said were just bullshit. Um, <laughs> that sounds uh, like an attack to me. Um, I mean, just it belies the facts of what he said. He said they're going to primary con concentrate on secondary markets. If the metal ends secondary market, then there aren't any primary markets. John, uh, the, agency, <laughs> the, um, the agency that Rob works for, CAA, uh, called me up yesterday told me that the, they're trying to get a, um, a date for a band called Psychedelic Furs, which is a, a, an artist that certainly is relevant to the audience here, uh, in Louisville. Now, my firm sells food beverage and provides some services in a building called the Louisville Gardens. Uh, that band probably isn't ready to play that building. Uh, there's a small theater in town. Uh, they can't find a promoter to do that band. I think that band has a lot of potential, and I think maybe not on this tour, but maybe by the next time they have a record out, they're going to be ready to play the 8,000-seat Louisville Gardens. So we're going to present that show in a 1,400-seat theater 
which we don't provide any services to, that's and good. probably will promoted. not do. That's being a promoter. That's, being a promoter. that's and not that's, what you said that, you, that your primary function is. I'm in the business of, of, of developing the markets and developing the facilities and helping bring shows to the facilities that we represent services in. If we, if we can do that with a promoter, if we can do it uh, either with a promoter or have the promoter come in and do it on their own, I'm delighted to do it. Last week I called up Doug Thaler and asked him about uh, bon Jovi uh, playing Blaisdell Center in Honolulu. Uh, my concern was not promoting the show there, as I think Doug will tell you, but, but whether or not the date was confirmed, whether or not he had any problems with it. Uh, I know that the artist has a history with another promoter in the market, and I'm delighted to hear that, and, and the primary concern to me was, in fact, the band was going to get the date confirmed. So, so we will do, we will promote shows, we'll co-promote shows, we will uh, help an artist play a building uh, if, if that show needs help being there. And I don't, uh, I think that you have to, you know, with the, you have to watch what we do. I think you have to, uh, to be creative with us. We haven't heard from any agents uh, yet, and Rob, being from CAA, I, I, you might want to respond. I was going to say that I, I think, <clears throat> I agree with what Doug said, that there should be a great deal of loyalty and I don't think it's a black and white issue. There are a lot of gray areas in how you develop bands, but unfortunately, there is a great level of middle artists who don't play arenas and are past the club level, and there is a diminishing number of good entrepreneurial promoters right now. And agencies need to develop new buyers. If it gets down to where there are only 10 legitimate promoters in the country, and that's what it's shrinking down to, a us agents have nowhere to sell. And I encourage buildings to buy shows. Because there are a lot of markets where I can't sell a date. We couldn't find a buyer in Louisville, Kentucky, and we needed a date there. That band should play Louisville. And Fred stepped up to the plate. Um, I would not ever cut a promoter out if I could avoid it, if management didn't tie my hands behind my back, out of a band that they had developed from the club level and the small hall level to the next level. But when we get into a situation where there's nowhere to turn, I'm encouraging local buildings to t step up and get involved. And if a building wants to be a promoter, then they have to promote. They have to be willing to take a chance on a club level or a small hall level, as in Pittsburgh, where I've said to Lance Jones, hey, you might have to do a show on a 3,000-seater, or you might have to go into the decade and buy a date from me if you want to be in business. Rob, how many, how many shows, approximately, do you think you've sold thus far to buildings or this type of promoter? Well, <laughs> rough, a rough figure. There are two and types of buildings. I mean, there are buildings who own the real estate, and they're, they're the only way we can sell them, which I don't think is what we're talking about here. But I've sold a number of dates to arenas who want to promote. Do they do a good job? Do they do as good a job as a promoter whose only business is promoting? In some levels, they do. Don't forget, these buildings promote circuses, ice shows. They get as, as in smaller markets, not in your market, John, but in many markets, they have as good advertising rates as the local promoters do. They're buying as much advertising. They're doing sporting events. They know how to promote a show. Yeah, they need a little help, but if somebody's not going to step up and take a Starship date or a Psychedelic First Date or any one of a number of bands that want to step up from the club level to the next level, I encourage people. It's a competitive market. It's free enterprise. I want to see other people. I want to see buyers out there who are aggressive. If the building's going to be aggressive in buying it, I hope they're going to be aggressive in promoting it. Mike McGinnis. Boone, <laughs> you want to say something? Yeah, there, I'll come to your defense, Fred. <laughs> you help me later. Um, <laughs> Stand back. <laughs> uh, there seems to be a direction. Yeah, really. There seems to be a direction on this panel where you've got some of the old traditionalists defending the way the, the business is run and, and some of the old line structures. And if we don't adhere to those old line structures, we're going to ruin the business. Um, I'm out there every day you know, working with different acts, working with different managers, working with different promoters. The biggest threat that I see to this business is not the guys like Fred Ordauer that are coming with new ideas and new ways to help out the agents. The biggest threat that I see to the business are people that are bored out of their minds, the promoters that aren't making any money anymore for whatever reason, the people that have gotten older, they're just tired of it. At least 50% of the people that I deal with in this business are bored out of their minds but they can't find another $100,000 a year job, so they're just kind of trotting along. Those are the people that are going to ruin this business, not the Fred Ordowers. Anyone bored? 
Hey, you might. You sure? <laughs> well, um, I, sure. Yeah, if I may just say, <clears throat> some of us are not bored, clearly still. And uh, I can't speak for other colleagues around the country. I've heard the complaint. I mean, I happen to know Mike fairly well, and I won't call him the goon. That's just my personal problem. <laughs> but um, there are apparently problems around the rest of the country, that some markets are not serviced very well. People are bored. People don't do a good job. And it is, still is a problem. But the fact still is <clears throat> that in Mike's particular case, he represents acts that are no lower than arena level at the headliner stage. He has spent some effort in the past on developing new acts. And we stepped up to the plate for an act that he had, which I thought was quite good and didn't, didn't happen. But by and large, he confines his efforts to headline acts only. If I understand the nature of this conference, that doesn't apply to too many people here in this audience. And when you're talking about helping people at the lower level, these gentlemen may have the right theory five years down the line or 10 years down the line, or maybe faster if you develop quickly. But they can't do much for you now if you're at a club level or a theater level. Now, the complaint that this, building, that this business is full of people who are bored and has a lot of validity, that people are not competent any longer, that's probably true too. Fact still remains that the core of the business is development, core of the business is taking the risk in the future, core of the business is making the effort at the level where you can't see the payback. I, th I, th I think what, what, uh, what Mike said has a lot of validity. There are, we do some, some management in our company and, and some tour management, and there are clearly a lot of old line promoters that are bored out of their mind and are uncreative. Uh, and they doesn't tend to... stop with promoters. They, excuse me? doesn't stop with promoters. No. But, but, but there also are promoters like, like the Don Law Company and like our company and Cellar Door, somebody mentioned, they're, they're all over the place, that are actively running clubs and running theaters. Um, I mean, we did 172 shows last year at the Ritz alone, just at the Ritz. We did over 250 club shows in our company, and, and we clearly do a lot of arena shows, too. So there, there, are, there, there, there are both kinds, as there are good tour accountants and bad tour accountants, as there are tour accountants who um, work uh, as part of the, the, the uh, team of promoter, artist, manager, agent, and there are some that are rebels that are trying to dismantle that system. Now, you may say that that system is, is old and stayed and uh, that you want new ideas, and there's no, there's no problem with new ideas. But if you dismantle that system for new ideas, that new system that you're operating damn well better be able to support all of the rest of the industry that the old system supported. That old system, sure, there might be time for, time for people to retire. You know, when sports guys get old and they can't hit the fastball anymore, they get, you know, they, they get moved out. But as long as you can hit major league pitching, then you get to play in the major leagues. Well, if you dismantle that system and, and you take away from the promoters who are doing their right job and are not bored and are running the Ritz or running the Palace or running the Paradise or running something like that and running the capital theaters of the world and the, the towers and stuff like that. If you put those guys out of business who are doing the right job and are trying to continue to, to rejuvenate the business with new artists, if you take away their profit motive because the majority of club shows that we do outside of New York lose money. The majority. More than 50% of the club shows we do in New Jersey or Albany, Rochester, Syracuse, Binghamton, any of those places we promote lose money. Uh, if you take the, the ability to not promote the Motley Crews or the Bon Jovi's, for example, that Doug represents or, or any of the agents represents, then, then they're not going to put on those little acts. So you're right. New ideas are terrific, but they better be able to support all of the, all of the uh, structure that keeps our industry viable. If I may just analogize real quickly, just to put a different flavor on this, to understand this. Those of you who are familiar with uh, professional baseball understand that um, major athletes and, and the, actually the equivalent of entertainers don't just happen on the scene. That the most successful franchises, and in fact the health of Major League Baseball, really is dependent on its farm systems. Someone's got to put the money up. Someone's got to go do the dirty work. Someone's got to go play the Class D leagues, the AA leagues, and the AAA leagues. This business is not really that much different. What you're talking about is working, providing the opportunity and the effort to, to play the minor leaguers to get them to the big leagues.
Jerry Aid, uh, I wanted to ask you, <coughs> what percentage of your business do you use buildings or these type of promoters that we've been talking about? Well, I think Rob Blight came up with a good point. We, as agents, have to search for buyers. Our major loyalty is strictly to the artist. We're employed by the artist and paid by them. The promoters are certainly people we have to develop and nurture and continue to help grow, but our loyalty isn't there. And John Shear, I don't think it's the lack of vibrant promoters that are the ones that we have to worry about. It's the guys like you and the laws that are going to stay in business. But as a result of guys not doing their homework and not, not hustling and a lack of understanding of certain things has created our necessity to go find buildings to do stuff. Now, Louisville is a great uh, example because Louisville in the black market is a very vibrant area. I do eight, ten shows a year with the Louisville Gardens. And John Shear and I have an ongoing argument that he says I, he always loses money with my company. Now, if Louisville can sell out the gardens with eight or ten shows a year in smaller capacity artists, certainly New York City can. But what I've found with, between black and white promoters in this town is that there's an innate lack of understanding of how to promote New York City. You can get a guy like uh, Al Heyman, who comes from Boston, spends 20 minutes a year in this town and can sell out the garden four or five times a year. and something's going on that's missing. I think that when you sat to me today and said, why do we do poorly in a show? There's got to be a lack of understanding of how to promote. And therefore, as agents, we've got to seek buildings, we've got to seek buyers, we've got to seek anybody possible to go find a way to make these acts break and, and, and develop. In the black world, we have a far limited uh, range in which to deal. And when we're selling LL Cool J, Run DMC, and the Beasties, those are all known acts now, but five years ago when they were out there hustling and struggling, nobody on this panel bought a date. Now, we had an argument last year, how come we can't do anything, uh, last month, John, excuse me. Uh, about excuse LL. Me. Excuse uh, me, Yeah. I played Run DMC. All right. How long the ago? First three years ago. Four years ago. I take exception. But for the most part, most of the guys don't. But you're one of the guys that are going to survive because you're out there hustling all the time. But we've got to keep finding things, and I think that the advent of buildings promoting is only going to put an edge to everybody, and it's going to make everyone work harder to develop and come home. Jane, uh, I want to ask you... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think for the... Go ahead. No. I think what we're all saying is anybody who will do a full-service job for an agent, an act, a manager, is what we're all looking for. When an act becomes enormous, anybody can promote the act in any market. What we're all saying is if everybody wants to get in this business from the ground level and work on everything, then whether it's a building, a promoter, whatever, that's the way to do it. Otherwise, this business won't be around. Okay. What, what I was going to say is I think this room should know that John and Doug Borg, who represents Don Law, are more the exception than the rule. There are a dozen great promoters in this country who still do a great job from the club level on up. But I know a lot of you are here from secondary markets and tertiary markets and are worried how come talent doesn't get to those towns and how come it doesn't develop in those cities. And that's where, as agents, we're in a quandary. I have nobody who'll buy shows in the Fort Waynes of the world. There is no club right now in Binghamton, or is there, John? I mean, I haven't done a club date in Binghamton in years. Um, so that, that's probably your concern because a lot of you are never going to get to promote New York City. But as agents, I'd love a secondary buyer or a club buyer in, the, in some of these markets. And that's why I encourage buildings. I'm not concerned about New York or upstate New York where John promotes or where Don Law promotes. They're great. And where Ogden Allied goes, I encourage Fred, and Fred's been there for me every time I've needed him from small to big. So these guys are the exceptions and nobody here is taking, you know, shooting at you guys. But I encourage, I need buyers. I want to develop bands, well, and if nobody's going to take a shot, you know, if Jim Baker steps up in the Northwest because nobody else is promoting up there, well, God bless him. And he'll buy a, a $2,000 act and a $20,000 act, and I'll sell it to them both because I want my bands to play there. If we get down to just 30, if all the tours in this country go down to play in 30 cities in multiple days, I'm going to be out of business, and so is everybody in this room. So is it easier to break bands, what with there being old promoters, new promoters, and now buildings as well? Do you, is, well do you, can you make that conclusion? I the term building. You know, the building could be a club, it could be a theater. You know, we, I seem to perceive that the arenas are one problem with buildings. But if there's a theater who wants to be an in-house promoter and wants to promote everything an agent has, that, there's nothing wrong with that. 
And there's a lot of markets like a Louisville where the major promoters take all of the major acts, but hardly anyone takes a small act in that market. And there are those markets all over the country. You know that, Jeff. Yes, I do. So you're and just saying this is competition and it's good. Yes, and I think competition is healthy. It makes the promoters who are in doing the best possible job wake up and all of a sudden be afraid that they're not the major promoter in that town. Ian, do you have any comments? If competition is healthy, why does Premier basically deal with one promoter in each market? Perhaps because a lot of the promoters Premier deals with do a very good job in a market on all levels. If there's a market that isn't being done, which is our major complaint from a lot of major promoters, especially in the Midwest, where when a Bon Jovi happens, Doug is, gets millions of calls saying, I want all of these cities where none of these promoters do any, you know, $750, $1,000, dollars act. But nor is there anybody else doing those markets. So a manager then sits down and figures out, well, I haven't had anybody come to me on any level, therefore I'll give it to whoever I like or had done good things for or whatever. And we, we probably deal with more clubs across the country in small markets than a lot of agencies do. We have a great network in the South where there's a lot of towns. Now, there is nobody coming to us on the next level. There's a lot of interest in doing club acts. There is not a lot of interest from anyone in doing 2,000 or 3,000 seaters, and you really have to get on the phone and find people. Don't you find the same thing, Ian? Very much so, yeah. So you know, the it's easy to book the small bands because you can bung them in, any, you know, and then the big bands is easy because they're calling you, but it's the in-between. Louisville and Puppy, the best one we get out of it is the school down there. There's a club and a school, and then there's the major promoters for the gardens and everything else. And then you have to go and find some promoter to do a 2,000 or 3,000 seater on an act, and that never happens. The, the, the two or three thousand. See, I, I don't know why. We talked about this. I remember last year. Um, and there's more agents than there are promoters here. But there doesn't seem to be over the last couple of years a, a two or three thousand seat business out there anymore. I made my living for over ten years promoting uh, a, a place called the Capitol Theater in New Jersey in Passaic that used to run between forty and forty-five shows a year. And then we used to do another fifteen shows in a four thousand seater down in Asbury Park. So, so we were doing, you know, 60 shows a year that were four and th between three and four thousand seaters. This year, in that same market, Northern New Jersey, we'll do maybe 15. It's not that we don't want to do them; we'd love to do them. A it doesn't seem to be the artists that do it, there's certainly as many. And B, again, like we said about the clubs out of town, I would say more than 50 percent of the 3,000 seat shows we do lose money. Kids don't seem to want to go to 3,000 seaters. There seems to be there's a set of kids who want to go to clubs whether it be to dance or to listen or the intimacy. There's a huge set of kids that would like to go, that go to the arenas for that whole scene that surrounds it other than, other than the, just the music, the parking lot scene, the, you know, walking around the halls, buying t-shirts. But I mean, we've had a series of acts in the last six months that, that their t-shirt business has started to approach the gross of ticket sales, um, which, which, which is wild. So I think that problem, and I don't promote down south or in the Midwest, but we're very anxious in, in New York State, New Jersey, and New Jersey to, to do 3,000 seaters. Those acts don't exist, or if they do exist, nobody comes to see them. I'm not sure we can solve that problem on this. Uh, Goon or Fred might be able to solve that problem, but I can't. I think that I think a 3,000 seat place is a great place to help uh, an artist at a stepping stone point in his career, uh, and I think it's the way that you can develop a, a larger collection of, of arena level acts, uh, there has to be new ways of looking at those 3,000 seat facilities. Uh, as you and I talked about several months ago, uh, the Javits Center here in town, which is a building that we manage, has a wonderful 3,000 seat facility that no one's ever used for a show. Uh, and if you and I get creative and you and I figure out how to take some uh, ancillary income from services and, and talents and relationships and skills that you have, we together can make a very, very successful facility, put on a series of shows which will turn around and help you develop artists in this town, in this market, which, you, which we want you to go on and enjoy at the Meadowlands and the Garden and Nassau and make a whole bundle of money with. 
you're right. It's not, it's not the, it's, in this particular case, it's not the facility so much as my experience for the last three or four years is the kids don't want to go to 3,000 seaters. I don't know why. I really don't. Because when we were all growing up, we were all about the same age. Um, <coughs> that's the thing. <laughs> uh, it's sad, isn't it? Um, but that's, that was the place the kids wanted to be at. It doesn't seem that. It does, I mean, maybe there's people here that are closer to the average concert age than we are anymore. The kids don't seem, at least in New York and upstate New York and New Jersey, with very few exceptions, the kids don't seem to want to go to 3,000 seaters. I think MTV's had a lot to do with that. I think you used to have a scene where, where uh, you know, you'd read about your band in the magazine or you'd hear their record at a party or you buy, you know, whatever, but if you wanted to see them move, you had to go to the show. Or if you wanted, you know, if you wanted to go check out a band and see what they were all about, you used to go to a show, go to a show whether you were a fan or not, and uh, you'd go and check them out. And you'd watch a couple of numbers. If you liked them, you'd stay and maybe go to the next. Through the roof. We're asking kids to pay fifteen, sixteen, seventeen dollars. to pay huge amounts of money to see one hit single. We're being forced by management and by road costs to jump bands from club levels to small arena levels when they don't deserve to be there. Um, and believe me, I'm as guilty as every other agent here because my hands are tied sometimes. Hey, I can't go on the road for less than 100 grand a week. Um, well, how you can't make 100 grand a week in a small hall tour. So we're, I don't know that this panel can come up with the answers, but a $15 ticket or even a $10 ticket in a club to see one hit single doesn't make sense. If we've got a number of tours out there right now where uh, bands are going out as an evening with and not carrying support to help develop young bands, which is criminal. Um, I give Tom Petty a lot of credit and Premier a lot of credit for putting a three-act package together and helping to develop some young bands. <coughs> I think <laughs> rather, I think some of the old school things that Mike was putting down is what built this industry and we should go back to, which is lowering ticket prices, tripling them up shows, packaging better, getting headliners to be not so egotistical and be willing to take a bigger support act on the road with them. All right, Doug was great. Doug Thaler kept Bon Jovi on as a support act up until the last possible second. All right, he could have headlined that band a year ago, but he was smart to keep him as a special guest, help another headliner and develop his band. I think we need more thinking along those lines and the kids will come back. You can't ask a kid to pay 20 bucks or when he plays for parking and the service charge on a ticket to, to see two hit singles. It's obscene and we've got to change it. By way of uh, maybe introducing another subject. Oh, Jeff, I'm sorry. Well, I was just, just going to say with respect to, the, to a three-act bill, um, I think that uh, you know union costs have pretty much you know come into you know, almost making that a prohibitive practice. I mean, you know, like for years and years, we all booked uh, you know three act bills, and the kids seem to like them. Um, it, it's more for the more for the for the, bang do, for the dollar. Yeah, more bang for the bucks. But uh, you know, all of a sudden, like you're you're looking at another four or five thousand dollars if you run another half hour, forty five minutes into overtime. And after all, like, you know, kids do you know, pay their money primarily to see the headliner, so if the, if the only answer is, well, the headliner will play only 50 minutes instead of 100 so that somebody else can, can be on the show, that's about the only you know, solution to that. So, Jane, is that what happened with Tom Petty? Did he go into uh, those kind of numbers yes. every night? Well, we had to figure out on every Tom Petty date, since the show was running three hours and 40 minutes, how much overtime was night, and it was a lot of money in a lot of places. And you can't act, ask Tom to cut his set or the middle act or the opening act. And a lot of buildings worked with us. We made deals in order to do this. Uh, and I think that's the role of the building and the promoters in doing any of these things. The buildings don't seem, they're all interested in making a lot of money, but what they're not concerned about is finding ways to make their buildings more successful. And the same thing with small theaters. If, if there's a, and there's a number of small theaters around the country that are 3,000 seaters that can be cut to 1,200, 1,400, close off balconies, make it cheap enough for acts to be able to play there and do three act shows with no union bills. That's the salvation of all of this. 
If buildings and secondary and major markets wanted to have more business, they would work at cutting expenses so we could all do the things necessary. And some buildings do, and other buildings don't. And I think a lot of the time, Fred with Ogden Foods, if they want to encourage business, what they should do is give better concession deals, better rent deals, better union stage yeah, Absolutely, that's that. exactly, you're, Jane, you're absolutely right because it's not just Ogden, we don't want to pick on no. Fred, but, <laughs> or FMI or you know, Harry but, but or any as them. a promoter, when you finally get an act that can headline an arena, you know, whether you know, you've participated with that act all the way up the road, usually neither the promoter nor the act has made very much money, maybe it's three, four, five plays that have got there. And then you get there and, and, and the act, because uh, after all, the, ticket, the people do pay to see the act, not the promoter and not the building. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the building decides, who have, who's not participated at all in that building process at all, they, they want 40% you know, of the concession rights, promoter gets nothing, all right? the act gets 60, but they should probably be getting, I always believe that, that the fairest way to do it is to cor the con concession rights should correspond to the rent. The rent's 10%, then the, act, the, then the building should get 10% for selling the merchandise. Um, the, the clean up, the clean up, the clean up is absurd. You know, the average kid that comes to a rock concert maybe, maybe brings a tissue that he drops on the floor. Yet, 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 you know, the, the soda, the beer, the hot dogs, the candy, all of that that ends up on the floor, the promoter and the act have to share in the expense of, of cleaning that up. Um, the promoter usually has to, if you really try to examine it, has to share in the cost of running a box office that also sells uh, ice capades tickets and, and, and football tickets and circus tickets. It goes on and on and on. So that perhaps somebody who is forward thinking as, as Allied Ogden, who manages buildings, might say, whoa, maybe you're right. Maybe the people who we make the most money on, which is rock and roll, they make more money on rock and roll than they do on basketball, on hockey, on ice capades or anything else, maybe they should start cutting them a fair deal. That's the biggest problem financially of, of, of the arena business anyway. Fred, can you control those kind of costs? Can sure. you affect those? Things? In, in the buildings where, where we provide enough layers of services, some, in some facilities we do uh, as little as sell food and beverage. In many facilities we do provide all those services and we are gravitating towards recognizing the fact that there are lots of things that happen uh, in a 10,000 seat arena when a concert takes place uh, other than 10 bucks uh, times 10,000 seats. There's a lot of other factors happening and, and you can best believe that when you call me up in a, for a building that we represent and start talking about uh, uh, there will be two support acts on the show and, and you want to develop both acts and bring both backs to the market, that's, that's got real growth for that building. Uh, give, me two, give me two intermissions to sell hot dogs and popcorn and t-shirts at and you'll be surprised what the numbers are going to look like. Fred, do you advocate the concessionaire uh, paying for the majority of the cleanup because you sell the hot dogs and beer and soda and that's the mess that's made? I spent 15 years paying all those same costs, John. I spent 15 years having all those same complaints. The reason this company picked me is to look at all those issues and say what will make a, a, a finite number of buildings attractive. I don't represent every building. We're never going to no, represent every For your every buildings, building. can we count on you picking up the cleanup? You, 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 <laughs> you pick up the, when you pick up the phone and call me and talk to me about shows or, or a, a, and in particular a show that's going to be attractive to us, you bet. So can the agents on the oh. panel please well, Fred, send some money over this one? I think is that you will give me a deal if it's a very important act and if it's not so important I don't get a cleanup deal. I think the issue either has to be that the building participates in the cleanup, that the band does not do it or not, not whether it's favorable for you or one act is going to sell out and the, next, the other one isn't. Jane, I want to ask you something. Doug, Doug addressed the issue of why most bands don't do three-act shows. Why did Tom Petty? Why did he commit to this seemingly money out of his pocket? And it was money out of his pocket. What I think Tom felt that there was a lot of groups going out this summer, there was a lot of competition. It is probably the biggest summer in outdoor stadiums that we've ever had in a long time. He felt that in order to sell tickets and to give uh, the kids a lot more than what they're used to, that's what he wanted to do. Uh, and so he, went, he thought about who he wanted on, went around to see who was available, and he felt that no one had did it in a long time, and it might help sell a lot of tickets. And there is a lot of competition out this summer. And the money is, as John knows, how much money has John taken out of the New York market that at one point there isn't any more money left for anybody? 
but it was, <laughs> it's a, it was a very difficult thing to put together because you had all of the building costs. And but, if you go one minute over 11 o'clock, you're into thousands of dollars. What, when I was talking about three-act shows, I'm not just talking about on an arena level. Um, I'm also concerned about all the bands now that want to do evenings with. I mean, there's a new music band, The Cure is touring America um, and doing stellar business. They do an hour and 40 minute show and charge 16.50 a ticket. Why aren't they carrying a special guest? Why aren't they helping a young band who was in a position they were in four years ago, right? And helping new music to develop even further. It's an evening with. We've got a number of club acts, all of us represent, that are making $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 a night that say, look, I gotta go do my own show. I don't wanna cut my set down. Find some local bands to open for me in the club. I wish we could put two or three bands together and say, screw who opens or closes, go play and see some people. All right? Where, I, a lot of you look at us agents and say, how come you can't do this? I wish we could, I think the managers wish they could. There's always a problem somewhere down the line, but as a business, it's not just on the arena level of making three act shows. We've got to make them two act shows. We've got to package up in 3,000 seaters. We all got to take, drop the ticket price and take a little less money and suck it up a little bit on the low end so we can get up to the top end. Otherwise, it's all going to be 20 superstars and we're all going to be struggling to find a middle business that doesn't exist. Mike, uh, or Goon rather, are you, is this a trend that we can expect from lookout acts, three act shows? I mean, you have a number of tours coming out, correct? You have I was Mick Jagger going to take a support right. act? Yeah, Mick Jagger going to take a support act. <laughs> I don't know. I was not involved in the creative decision of who was going to open the Tom Petty tour, so I really can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this then. Uh, are you going to endeavor to undertake the booking of acts that are play 3,000 seat halls? What's the venue? Instead of, well, Mick Jagger's playing arenas. Are, are you going to apply yourself and your services to acts? I am not involved in the decision of who's going to open the Mick Jagger tour, no? so okay. I don't know. No, I mean you personally, though. Me personally? Yes. Are you going to also apply yourself to undertaking the booking of tours other than arena tours? What, what are you going to give back to the industry is what I'm asking you in a um, bleak way. Uh, <laughs> I would question, uh, define booking tours, please, for me. <laughs> You're excused. Define booking tours. What's that? Let's just use the model of Mick Jagger. Are you going... Well, okay, I'm maybe getting ahead of myself. Goon was involved, not involved, solely involved in booking the Mick Jagger tour. He went out and called the buildings, he made the deals. Is this correct, Goon? Right? Yes, I made all the deals. Yeah. And instead of, instead of the normal structure, which most of us here represent, of having an agent that gets a commission on these dates, Mike was paid uh, a salary to undertake this. So it's very different. And my question is, are you going to apply your same skills, experiences, and expertise with acts other than just arena acts, which clearly an act like Mick Jagger is, is, <laughs> is a big money earner and a very attractive act? Are you going to help develop just acts no somehow? Problem. Do you feel any obligation to do so? I guess my first response to that question is, I don't know how you found out what my fee is or whatever, but I don't think you know what it is. And um, secondly, when you want to talk about agents and booking and stuff, um, I'd like you for me to define agent, because if you want to define agent to somebody who has an office on 57th Street or who has a Mercedes with a telephone in it in Los Angeles, I think the answer is you're going to see some changes, yes. So could you define agent for me? I, like, I don't know. I like Mercedes. your definition, actually. <laughs> 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 I drive a Toyota. <laughs> I don't have a car. Well, so am I going to define agent? All right. Does anyone else have any? I don't want to pick on Mike either, but does anyone in the panel? Hey, let's have, pick on Mike. You want to pick I'm on Mike? I'm ready. Let's go. Hands up for <laughs> picking on Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Mike. Let's go. Listen, I don't want to define aging, but I've got a, a point that I think we can all bring to attention here, that the development of new music is, is, is not what's on this panel. All of us here have quite a few years together in, in the music business, and we all had to help develop it. I think that what our duty is now to young people, and we had to suffer through it, is that we deal with people that haven't been in business and make unjust demands of us to thrust on promoters and on buildings and everything else. 
and we have got to educate the younger kids coming in, the 18 to 24 year old managers that have these young emerging acts that are going to be big time money makers, and help to develop them in the, the thinking that we're all talking about here. I think as agents and as managers and as promoters, we at times in order to enhance our own position, offer people more than what's realistic because they demand it of us. <laughs> We can't always live up to it, but if we can all be cognizant of it and work in that arena to develop acts, I think we'd have more middle line acts for the 3,000 seaters because we've all jumped people from the club level, although I do believe MTV has interrupted us for a minute. We've jumped them from the club level to the moderate arena level without taking the middle stance, and I think that comes from lack of, on a lot of parts, knowledge and understanding and, and rethinking this thing. The business has emerged and become mature, as we have in this business, and we've got to go back to what we were doing when we were all 24 years old. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, not in terms of making money, but in terms of developing the business. Because I think we're going to be stuck with a lot of headliners and no midline acts. Certainly, Doug, you in developing Bon Jovi have spent many, many years struggling very hard to get to where you are now. And hopefully you're going to bring a string of acts behind that or, or continue your business. Yeah, you want me to find an agent for you? Pardon? You want my definition of agent? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm going to regret this, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Before you do, though, can I just interrupt for one moment? Go ahead. Is somebody collecting questions here, uh, uh, written questions that I specified at the beginning of the... Is there a monitor in the house, a doctor, an osteopath? A nurse? No. Hey, I like it. Well, I'll tell question. you what. There's a monitor. I appoint John Shear to collect questions. Oh. <laughs> Okay. I, I have a question for John Shear. Wait a minute. Let, let Mike I, go I first. Let's, 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 I want to hear Doug's. Um, I want to hear Mike's definition, Mike's but I just want to make sure. Okay. Mike, Someone what is an agent question. to you? What's an agent, babe? Let's go. Sugar doll. Wait, my turn? Yeah, it's your um, turn. In 1987, when you're putting together a tour, okay, I feel there's two forces that you need to make that tour happen. There's one, you can talk about Tom Petty or whoever. There's one person that needs to make all the creative decisions. What type of buildings they need to play, what type of support needs to be there, on and on and on. And those are the types of decisions that agents, since the day this business started, have made. And the good agents that can find talent, that know where to put them, that know how to package them, that have the wherewithal to talk managers and acts into doing those right things like Ian has done many times, those agents are going to be around for a long time and they're not going to be threatened by me or Fred or anybody else that do what we do. Um, in 1987, this, this business is not an infant business anymore. It, it is driven by all the business marketing decisions that any other business needs to be, be involved with. Um, in the promotion business and the agency business in the last three or four years, there's a lot of new terms that a lot of us have never heard before, like bankruptcy, mergers, acquisitions, computers, and debt financing. And every agency, every management company, every act needs a financial management side to, to run that tour. Um, for the creative people that haven't either within their own company or from outside, like my company, contracted somebody to do these financial type decisions, they found themselves in big trouble. And that's the reason some of the companies that are in the business today are having problems. Um, this is a creative business. And whenever you have these two people working on a tour together and you have a monetary decision and you have a creative decision and they, the, the two points differ, the creative decision has to take precedence because whenever you make crash crazy decisions or monetary decisions, if a tour is being driven by those type of decisions, you're going to find that there's problems. And the agents out there that are still making good creative decisions are going to be around for a long time and they're not going to be threatened by me or anybody else in the business because they know what they're doing. Okay. Well, that was a lot of questions. That's my definition Thank of agent. You. Thank you. Anyone care to comment or expand, well, Ron? I think, I think what we're really saying is that as this industry goes into its third decade, and as we examine the system as it is today, it has a lot of strengths, it has a lot of weaknesses, there's a lot of questions about what we all need to do to let it continue to evolve, and, and we all have to work collectively to 
find the questions and the answers. I, I, I got to answer what Mike just said because I disagree with him. I think he's off base. All right, that was a wonderful speech to say, let creative run the ship. But you are running the ship because you can offer somebody a cheaper way to do it. It has nothing to do with creativity. You're doing it for a cheaper price with no expertise in developing acts. You're coming in as a dollar man. You mentioned the word business 14 times. That's what's ruining this is that it's all business. There's still a creativity and an art to it, and there has to be some concern. When all you're booking is the headliners on an arena level, how can you talk about creativity? You haven't put a band into a club and a 3,000-seater and said, hey, let's charge a buck less, or let's do a co-promotion, or let's put three bands together, and then put them in a big building. So don't tell me creativity runs your ship, because it doesn't. You're doing it for a cut rate. You're the J.C. Penny of agencies. <laughs> Once again, I don't know, I don't think there's anybody on this panel that knows what my fee is for anything that I do. It's a lot less than 10%. Would you care to share it with us? Um, I will say to Rob that if, if your pricing structure is, deep, if you rely on tradition or state law or friendship, to, um, to price your services, I think you're in big trouble. But there has never been a tour that I'm involved with or that I've worked on that doesn't have a creative force. And I don't want to get into specifics on any of the things that I'm working on because it's not fair to the people that I work with. But every tour that I'm working on has a creative force. They hire me to do some financial monetary decisions or whatever. And on the Mick Jagger tour, there is a guy that's being paid a lot of money to make the creative decisions, and it's not me. Blue agents aren't creative. And he has, also done, he has also done a lot of smaller acts in a lot of venues around the world. And that's the reason he's making those creative decisions. All I'm doing is merely providing I'm a service to him to help him make the financial decisions. Like you, you just asked me who's going to open the Mick Jagger tour. I have no idea because it's got nothing to do with me. It's a creative decision. And they're not going to ask me who, to, who but should the open the The person who books that tour should be involved in that decision. That's and he I'm is saying. involved in that decision. No, but you're booking the tour. No, I'm if well, you're putting define the buildings booking on, a tour. If you're putting the buildings on hold, if you're talking to the local marketplace, which you are as the representative of that act, then you should be involved. I talked to John Cher about booking a market. I need to talk to him about what the best support act is in that market that will help my headliner. If you're not talking to that promoter about who should support Mick Jagger, you're not doing a full service. That's what we do. We're full service agents. That's what's going to build the young bands and develop the business. Several not someone who just makes a deal. It's Se not just business. Several agents on this panel, okay, have asked me about support on the Mick Jagger tour. And I have told them who to contact regarding support on the Mick Jagger tour because it's got nothing to do with me. That's my point. You're miss the point is... If, if you define... Rob, if you define putting a building on hold as being an agent... That's one part, um, but that's all you're doing. What I'm saying is an agent should be involved in every aspect of the artist's career. And if you're going to book the local marketplace, then you should be involved... And the in person the that's doing the creative decisions on the Mick Jagger tour is involved in every aspect of the tour. Absolutely. All right, look at this. Amen. Sorry, we're real sorry. We have some, you could learn something. You should learn about this, because what's gonna happen is you're, there aren't gonna be promoters left in this country and agents when you have a young band who wanna work, because they're gonna get to a level where somebody's gonna go and book it for a cut rate, and it's gonna be nobody. Mm. Okay. okay great. We're getting to questions right now. There's a question here directed to John Scher. Who gains what by your new relationship with the Nassau Coliseum? And there's a second question. Please explain the seeming unconscionable lack of security and safety precautions at last Sunday's Dead Dylan concert in the Meadowlands Stadium. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Easy. Um, the Nassau Coliseum arrangement that uh, uh, our companies entered into a uh, relationship with Nassau Coliseum uh, together with Larry Vaughan, who's a promoter who lives out in Long Island, uh, for the sole purpose of bringing more shows to Nassau Coliseum. There was a time many years ago that Nassau Coliseum ran uh, 30 or 40 shows a year. Last year, I believe it went down to 12. Uh, we were able to, in a very simple entrepreneurial way, make an arrangement with them whereby to the artists, 
to their agents, uh, the expenses of, of, of presenting a show at Nassau Coliseum have been brought tremendously down. Um, uh, so simply, what our relationship has done and who's it helped is it's helped the, fa it's helped the fans. Uh, there'll be more shows at Nassau Coliseum. Nassau Coliseum primarily serves a mar the Long Island market of Nassau and Suffolk of a marketplace of about two million people. There have been fewer shows. There'll be more shows. There have already been more shows there. Um, artists will be more interested to play a second or third date in metropolitan New York, serve that market. The, pe the people who live out there um, won't have to drive into New York City or over to Jersey in the Meadowlands. Uh, artists will make more money. Um, quite honestly, we as promoters will make somewhat less money on a percentage basis than we might in another facility, but we're going to be able to do more volume, which is unfortunately been the, 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 the rule of thumb. More volume is something that's become necessary for major promoters. So I think in that particular case, it'll bring more shows for the facility, it'll bring more shows to the people, um, and, uh, and it'll have more business for our company and for Larry's company. Um, as far as the Dead Dylan show is concerned, uh, the... What do Dead Dylan shows have to do with new music, John? Well, I think... That's my question. Uh, in, all, in all due respect, I think that both of those artists have a lot to do with new music. Uh, they were both uh, clearly pioneers w in, in rock yeah, and roll. Um, well, someone asked a question, Ian. I mean, I'm not making yeah. this up. Someone asked a question. The question either had to be directed from someone who um, has uh, a lack of knowledge of the marketplace, perhaps someone who promotes or uh, lives uh, a long ways away from New York City and New Jersey, or uh, someone who got there very late in the day. Uh, there were some problems. This is a show, and I'll try to be very brief, that drew 71,000 people. Um, they all got in very orderly. There weren't any problems. There weren't any police problems. There weren't any security problems. Um, right before the show started, I made a very big mistake. Um, I tried to, as I have in the past at Giant Stadium, shows explained to the kids that were up in the uh, stands that they shouldn't come down to the uh, field, that the field you know, was there for the domain of the people who were that down on the field, uh, either not enunciating properly or, uh, or perhaps not stating my case in the way I should have. Um, the uh, th several thousand kids came down in the field. It looked like it was a big problem. Uh, it turned out to be less of a problem. I was very concerned. I was mortified, quite honestly, as a promoter. The ushers who had uh, been hired by the sports authority weren't in the places that they had been instructed to be at that time, and therefore there was some fence jumping. Um, I'm sorry about it. I'm very grateful that no one got hurt. We did prepare as well as we thought we could prepare. We had 50% more security people than had ever been at Giant Stadium, and there have been 15 shows at Giant time. Stadium. Uh, and never had an okay. incident like that. But if whoever, rose, uh, whoever uh, brought that question up, uh, if there's someone who has any knowledge of this particular marketplace and someone who's done shows in a recent time in that marketplace and really understands the psyche of, the, of, of these kids, I'd be glad to privately or publicly discuss how to, uh, how to fix that problem. We screwed up a little bit. And I don't Mr. Mind Graham, that we did. Uh, you want, Phil Graham, do you want to address? Excuse me, there, the, Bill, in all due respect, there were too many people on the field. They probably numbered about 15,000. The entire stadium had 71,000 people in it, and there weren't anything close to 50,000 people on the field, and everybody in, the, in, the, in their reserve seating had hundreds of exits. Nevertheless, there were too many people on the field in a general admission situation. Um, what really happened, to be perfectly honest with you, and you deal with these artists, these exact two artists, you used to manage one of them. Um, 
as recently as 48 hours before the show, those boxcars were designed. They weren't part of the system. They weren't part of the advance. They weren't part of the security plans. All right, they were put there to put Diamond Vision on 48 hours before. Um, as a promoter, I wasn't given any choice. They were put down. As a facility, um, I think I, as the promoter, because it's ultimately my responsibility for the health and safety of the people who come to my show, and the facility, I think we were remiss. We made a mistake. It won't happen again. Okay, I'd like to get on to a different subject. No, the building is not part of the promoting team. You asked, I assume that you wrote this question. This, yeah. um, the, 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 the building is not part of the promoting team. The building and my company and Larry Vaughan's company have made a long-term business arrangement with them that enables us to pass savings on to artists and therefore attract more artists. They are not part of the risk-taking and they are not part of the promotional effort. Does that answer the question? Let's go on. Let's go on, Bill. How, how many people here are managing act that's worried about playing in 50,000? I mean, do, is anybody here Rob, there's a question for you. We're going to go on. Rob, there's a question for you. Do you seriously think acts will take lower fees in order to help lower ticket prices? Um, absolutely. Uh, we're working in two situations right now. Uh, one with Arista Records and a band called Cruzados, where we have had conversations about the record company underwriting the tour so that we can literally cut their fee in half of what they're probably worth right now so we can keep the ticket price under $5 a night on a club tour. Um, and that's specifically so in the heat of all the competition out there, we can put together, we can fill a club. The other thing we're working on, and a number of the labels are aware of this, is a tour this fall underwritten by Coors Beer called Foreplay, which will involve four bands, okay, which will involve four bands, new artists from four different labels. We will give the shows to the clubs absolutely free. All right, there will be no cost to the buyer. All the tickets will therefore be given away free over local radio and to all colleges. And what we're hoping to do is each label will put in a small p fee. There will be one tour poster, one truck, one bus, one tour manager, and four bands. And hopefully the press, local radio, and the local marketplace will take this to their heart and say, Jesus, here's a chance to see four new bands instead of one, and we get to see it for nothing and maybe create some excitement. Uh, all the labels that we've contacted are unbelievably supportive and will pay for that so that we can put some people in the clubs again and develop a new and vibrant business as opposed to having to charge outrageous ticket prices. So yes, the bands will drop their fees if we can drop the ticket prices and bring some of the costs down. There's a couple of um, questions that go along this line here. It seems that only the only ones willing to do 3,000 seat shows are colleges. When an act gets to the arena level, the colleges then lose the show. Can colleges promote or get a shot at promoting at a level outside of colleges if they contribute towards breaking the act? I address that to any agents here. <laughs> no? Yeah. Yeah, yes, Occasionally, colleges do promote larger bands. Most of the time at that point it does go to the promoter in the marketplace. On, on bon Jovi went to a Starkville, Mississippi date, which was promoted by the school. What I think goes into the decision of not, of either trying to involve the school or involving the promoter is the production, the safety, and how how many tickets the band is going to sell. If it's an enormous production, most of the managers are very concerned that all people are very professional in doing it. One of the problems you have with a lot of schools, there are also a great many very good schools, but most of the schools don't grow production-wise with artists. And so therefore, you have to take into account that factor making that decision. Then it also the size of the buildings, whether an act is going to go downtown and play to five or 6,000 more people. So I don't think it's a very simplistic answer. Okay. 
There's a question here concerning uh, a formal or informal arrangement between promoters, agents, and venues regarding territoriality, specifically blackballing venues who choose to disregard this for whatever reason. Is there an unofficial agreement for blackballing venues? Does anyone care to, on the panel care to answer that one? <laughs> well, there is, I, I'll answer it then. Th there's, there's no official agreement. Um, <coughs> you, you give me yeah. your list, I'll give you my list. Okay, just, and that's the answer. I, I, was, I, was, I was involved in, in an antitrust situation. I mean, they're, they're, it's a very touchy situation for everyone up here. Um, the nature of the music business seems to be territorial. Um, and, and it probably is because most promoters uh, feel, I certainly feel that way, um, that they don't have the expertise outside of the markets that they concentrate on. I don't try to promote shows in Pittsburgh or in San Francisco because I don't know the local, the local expertise of those markets. And, and there is some subtleties, you know, who's the right reporter, you know, where should you put the posters up that they'll stay up, what disc jockeys will, will talk a little bit more about your show. Uh, there's a lot of that that has to do with smaller shows and middle-sized shows. And, and it is rare, at least in my experience, that good promoters can develop that ex expertise in a wide range of areas. And certainly, distance has a great deal to do with it. It's very difficult to be able to, to I used to, many years ago, try to promote Madison, Wisconsin. It was ridiculous. I couldn't get to Madison, Wisconsin very often, and I didn't have that expertise. Um, so, so I think that, that the nature of our business lends itself to territoriality but I can tell you from a first hand point of view that every agent, not only on this panel, but throughout the country is scared, it's scared shitless about the threat of, of, uh, of territoriality and works very, very hard to try within the context of doing the best job for their clients to make those clients available to anybody who's qualified. If, if I may add to that, it, it appears perhaps to the uninitiated that it has the appearance of some kind of backroom, cigar-filled decision by maybe people like here at this table who carve up the country and that's the way it is. The fact the way decisions are truly made and the pressure that really exists amongst the people in this dais who represent, I think, as you've now found out, people who have made a, an ongoing commitment to building businesses, which is new acts, is that agents, managers, and promoters as well, exist because they make the right choices much more often than not. And when you're dealing with a, an incredibly valuable piece of equity, which is a performer's appearance, very limited appearance, in a marketplace, be it 250 seats for the first time ever, when you've got a radio station co-promoting it, and you're doing it at a dollar ticket, and whether you're doing 60,000 seats at a stadium, grossing a million and a half dollars in appearance, all of that stuff that's all the performer has to offer and to sell. It has got to be jealously guarded and protected and maximized. The number of people who can make the right call all the time and not embarrass anyone, not put the manager at risk, the agent at risk, or the act at risk, is very small. And we all exist on the last deal we made, the last arrangement we made. You've Here's got to make the right choice. Sorry. And therefore, most of the time, People in this business go with the proven war horses who are not screwing up and are still doing the best they possibly can. And has the appearance, after all is finally said and done, it may look like they're informal arrangements. But the fact is it's really the marketplace at work, behind the scenes, looking for the best possible arrangement. Here's a question that says, what can we do about the high insurance costs? That can be addressed by anyone on this. Uh, please mention how damaging an artist's blowout, not showing, is to the promoter, and especially to the artist. Please talk about small clubs or secondary markets. This is a new music seminar. Insurance is a big problem. Insurance is a huge problem. Uh, I don't think anybody here has, uh, has an answer to it. It's gone in the last 10 years from a nickel to, I understand some promoters are paying over 50 cents a head. Um, we Is that for all, across the board? All across shows? the board, all shows. Some acts, um, Billy Joel comes to mind, has been smart enough to be able to go to an insurance company and say, hey, there's no damage and there's no um, significant incidents at our shows, so how about giving us a lower rate? And they've passed that on to the promoter. Um, 
we as a company work very hard security-wise, contrary to what the incident that uh, Mr. Graham just brought up, to try to keep uh, our shows as safe as possible. We've had a pretty good success, and, and uh, uh, we challenge the insurance companies at the end of each year with a, with a thing that's called a, um, uh, an incident run or a cost run of how many, how many claims have been made against us, and we've been able to keep our insurance rates about 15 cents under the norm of, uh, of most promoters. Our insurance rates now are uh, about 32 or 34 cents in that area. Um, it's still too much, uh, and, and uh, other than the insurance companies are a lot bigger and more powerful than we are, um, I can't do anything more than try to work real hard on security and, and to develop the best security staffs that we can and try to keep those incidents down. Doug, what do you, what do, you do as a manager about insurance? What concerns do you have? What can you do to help? With insurance? Yeah. You know, well, does MAC take any steps? I don't know that there's there's a lot we can we can do. Um, you know, uh, we, we have our own insurance problems from our perspective. Uh, both of our headliners use pyro. Um, it's getting harder and harder to get insurance for that. Um, I don't know if there will be py pyro and, and shows, uh, you know, that, that kind of flash and pop in the future, I kind of that, but I see that the insurance rates are rising, but so are uh, automobile insurance rates. That's, you know, as, as more people, like, make claims, you know, like, valid ones or invalid ones, more money is spent to defend the claims, pay the claims, et cetera, and it's just the same s snowball you see with, like, homeowner's insurance or liability insurance or whatever else. There's a question for Ian. <coughs> Is it best for an artist to have a manager and booking agent in two separate people? Well, yeah, it's illegal, I think, for you to be both. You can't be the manager and the agent, I don't believe. But in any case, yeah, you can't be a good manager and a good agent because there's too much involved. The, the, uh, the manager is involved with the recording and the choosing the, the road crew and all the, you know, all the too many aspects for him to really be in touch with what's happening in the marketplace the way an agent is. But also, I just don't, I don't think it's legal. There's an interesting thing here. There's a, a stranger sound came into Mr. Bill Graham's voice both times he said the word agent in his opening speech. Why? What are the major bones of contention between promoters and agents? I just thought it'd be interesting to ask Bill, would he prefer to deal with an agent or the goon? <laughs> Bill doesn't talk no, to me sorry. anymore. <laughs> Bill? Oh, there he is. I think the big problem with someone taking on the job that Mr. McGinley's taken on is that he totally disregards and disrespects the history of some of the promoters who have dealt with this particular artist in the past. In this particular case, Mick Jagger's the lead singer, was the lead singer of the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones have had long-standing relationships with many promoters throughout the country. Most of them have done great jobs for them. So what happened in this case, they chose a tour director that lives in London, who's a very capable, professional promoter in Europe. The financial people behind Mr. Jagger chose him. He chose Mr. McGinley. They then went around the country and started asking people about Mick Jagger. What was not done in our case, we were not called and said and asked, what is your past history? They never looked at the last 15 years to see what our involvement was prior to 81, 82 when we did the entire country with all the other respective local promoters. Mr. McGinley, when he went about the job of calling around the country, putting holes on holes, had no fathom of my history with the Rolling Stones and many others. And what was done, you took the opportunity take, to take your relationships and your personal relationships, pro and con, with many of the promoters around the country and dealt your markers and your cards into the picture. Mr. Goldsmith, Mr. Lowenstein, and Mr. Jagger, most of the time didn't have the vaguest idea of what you were doing. And we had to undo much of your work because you have problems with our company, just as we have problems with you 
your personality and the way you deal with people. And that's my problem with you, and that's why I prefer to work with most professional agents than working with you, because you disrespect people and you show disrespect publicly to people who don't agree with your way of doing business. You come on very heavy with people that you shouldn't, and you know that, and we've dealt with that many, many times. I don't like the way you treat people. <laughs> we have a million questions here. A lot of them are very specific, <clears throat> as we've seen. And uh, we're going to be here after this ends, so the more specific ones, I think, can be addressed to the individual people that they were addressed to in writing. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to ask one question of John Scher. I think I may have even asked it last year. What good is a guarantee when it is no guarantee? In other words, if a ticket, if you, if you guarantee me 10 grand for an act, and for whatever reason, it doesn't you know, you, you call up three days before the event saying, fuck me, it's only tickets, and you want to renegotiate, and it's either that or blow it out or accept half the fee or something. I mean, in the case here, we had uh, a show with Bad Brains, which you looked at the ticket sales and you became very concerned and you wanted to blow it out. When we had done posters, we had told everybody here at the seminar to come, I and mean, it was, you know, obviously a lot more than the, the guarantee involved to the band. Uh, and so we were left with an option to, to blow the whole thing out and accept a thousand dollar cancellation fee, which of course is nothing compared to what you lose by, you know, blowing out such an event. Uh, and I don't mean on this specific event, but, but generally, what do you do when you've promised a certain guarantee, it's contracted, it's every, you know, the whole tour is based on what the band's guaranteed, 